All right, we're live. Uh, welcome to my live stream. I'm Joshua Kemble. Um, I'm a cartoonist, illustrator, and graphic designer. I've been doing uh, graphic design and illustration for about going on like 20 years now. And when I'm not uh, doing graphic design or illustration professionally, um, what I do right now is like work full time as a, a art director for my day job. When I'm not doing that, I'm working on graphic novels, graphic novels like Two Stories, uh, which was my first graphic novel um, that talks really openly about my journey dealing with uh, depression, as well as caregiving for somebody with panic disorder and uh, sort of um, uh, the hypocrisy of uh, like witnessed when growing up at a Christian school and uh, a lot of like childhood stories like um, dressing as Indiana Jones for an entire year uh, doing cosplay at a school uh, when cosplay wasn't even a word yet. So that's two stories and that's available um, on Amazon. Um, and then if you guys uh, saw me at TCAF, that's my son in the background. <laughs> um, so uh, if you guys were there or saw me at TCAF, um, my graphic novel, uh, Jacob's Apartment, which is a story uh, done in the vein of Eternal Sunshine for the Spotless Mind or Ghost World. It's like a uh, a doomed romance story. And I think Ben is talking about his iPad uh, running out of batteries, which is just inexcusable. How could somebody's iPad run out of batteries in the background? Um, anyhow, so uh, Jacob's apartment um, talks about these two roommates who are both uh, kind of seeking meaning in their lives, um, pursuing their dreams. Jacob is trying to be a professional cartoonist, and Sarah is uh, getting interested in the idea of editing books. Both have like a shared love of books and are going through crises in their lives. Uh, Jacob ha has dealt with the recent loss of his father um, to uh, cancer and is sort of questioning his faith and his identity. And then... Uh, apparently benji is running around like a silly pants um okay so uh and then sarah um is also dealing with um a broken relationship with a previous uh boyfriend also her professor um and he's moved away and so she's kind of trying to find her place and uh trying to fill that void with like a um a bunch of one night stands both of them are questioning their identity and both find um, their identity and meaning um, with each other. So, yeah. So if you guys could hear me <laughs> over all of that, um, that's basically uh, the two books that I have out. Uh, Jacob's Apartment is available um, right now for pre-order pretty much anywhere um, books are sold. Um, and I just said for pre-order, but it was released on the 7th. And also, if you're in Southern California, I'll be doing a signing of uh, Jacob's apartment at Barnes & Noble in at the Palmdale location uh, from like 1 to 5 o'clock. And then I'm hoping uh, to kind of have like a meetup afterwards at Bravery Brewing, too, with whoever uh, of my friends or, or like fans uh, decides to kind of come out and, uh, and check out that signing. Um, and also it'll be like a celebration of the release of a graphic novel that took me about five years to make. So that is Jacob's apartment and two stories. And, uh, and that'll basically do it for that. So, um, so now we're going to get into the main content of this channel. Um, what I usually do is during, uh, during this stream, I'll often work on stuff. Uh, work on my comics and what I'm working on right now is not death but love uh, the strange supernatural case of Elizabeth Barrett Browning and uh, in the background you're going to see a lot of stuff going on because it's still daytime and I usually do these streams around like 9 p.m. but uh, but I'm trying to get ahead get more done on the comic so uh, so what I'll be working on is let's get over to the kind of work stream and I'll explain how that works so, okay, so right here is the page that I'm going to be coloring. Uh, this is page 19 um, of the graphic novel that I'm working on. And so what I'll be doing is, like, working on this, 
um, coloring it and then uh, just kind of chatting about things that are on my mind. And, um, and then of course, uh, during the times that I'd be doing roughs or thumbnails, usually there will be a section of the script down there. But obviously right now we're just gonna be coloring this page. That's our goal uh, during this stream. And so uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So I don't think I've done a live stream since getting back from uh, Toronto Comics and Arts Festival. And so uh, I feel a little rusty, honestly, doing a live stream. It's been about a week um, and I've been working and carving away at this page and then just sort of recovering from um, just exhaustion, honestly, of like being out of work for a couple days, um, like at, where I work as my day job. Uh, when I got back, there was like tons to catch up on. Um, and then also my body was still adjusting from jet lag, uh, which is kind of surprising. But like, I guess international travel just has more of a, at least for me, it, it took me a little bit longer to kind of recover and get used to. So, um, but I'm back at it. I'm doing my streams and uh, we're going to get into this. So this page, um, Elizabeth uh, Barrett Browning, at this point, she's Elizabeth Barrett and she's sneaking out. Wilson, her maid, is helping her pack. They're sneaking away and to a carriage that is waiting outside and was a beast to draw. So that's kind of where we're at, and uh, I'm going to basically pull the colors probably from a previous page that showed the exterior. Um, but first, let's get into just the white on the page. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, um, and this is a little trick that I remember, remembered to kind of do, which is keep the lines and stuff separate. So this is going to go select uh, inverse. Oh, wait. Select, modify, expand. So I'm doing my selection. I'm expanding it under the line art so that we have that kind of going. And... So then what I'm going to do is basically start flatting this page and we'll kind of see how it goes. Edit fill. And I can literally fill that with any color, but uh, black will work. Just go ahead and do another color fill. And then underneath this, I'm probably going to do one that uh, is going to cover the areas that aren't covered in that selection, which is like these text bu bubbles. So yeah, it took a while to kind of adjust and get back in the flow of things. Um, and uh, and then I've been carving away at this page. There were a couple revisions I had to do at the beginning of the week um, where I changed Elizabeth's dress because we found out that the dress I had her in in the previous sequence um, wasn't like super period accurate. I, I had done research on it and I had thought it was really good research and it turned out completely not to be. <laughs> um, and so we changed uh elizabeth's dress so i don't know if you guys remember uh the last few pages but uh oh nice uh dd Dee Dee said welcome back joshua kremble <laughs> yeah so that was one of the funniest things um it kind of became a bit during the uh during the trip that even my editor kind of made a joke on twitter about um from graphic mundi but uh for my panel oh here i was going to show you guys the new dress so the previous dress was like this kind of shoulderless um, white dress that I had found online uh, doing research. And it turned out it was just pictures from articles about Elizabeth's marriage, but uh, they weren't directly from Elizabeth's marriage. It was of a dress that Elizabeth Barrett wore, but it was likely um, worn uh, when she was much younger. So we kind of modified it for this more kind of like this blue one. Um, and so I had to revise 17 panels to kind of make up for that. So that's kind of basically that and the pencils here. 
are like uh, the two things that I was kind of working on. But yeah, so what Didi was talking about with Joshua Kremble, though, that's a shout out to uh, a programming error where um, for my panel, they had uh, called me Joshua Kremble, um, K-R-E-M-B-L-E, which I've been joking for a while is going to be like an alternate personality of mine. That's like the dark, evil uh, Joshua Kemble will be called. Either that or it'll be like when I start doing, you know, like strange, like installation art. Um, I think that's when Joshua Kremble will come out and uh, and start making um, awesome, weird installation art. That's like my postmodern future, you guys. Um, anyhow, so let's see here. I think we got all of this. The only thing I'd like to do is get, I need to get the color fill underneath. Like, let's see the areas we've got so far. So, yeah, so the, the only other area I'd like to get is like this space here. Oh, let's get here. Um, let's try the borders. Okay, select, modify, expand. Okay, so we're going to do this and then fill. But I have to say I'm pretty excited to be almost to page 20. And my hope tonight, um, like what I want to do is uh, I'll be working on this and in theory it would be cool to at least get a head start on uh page 20 um and the pencils and stuff like later tonight um <laughs> oh here's uh here's Didi's. i love the uh icon here for kremble let me show it kremble <laughs> yes welcome to kremble's channel anyhow um uh, she also said, it is looking awesome. I missed a couple of these pages. Yeah, it's like, it, it's pretty exciting. Um, and, and like I said, the pages look a little different because I had to kind of go through and modify the dress in each uh, page. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm excited about, again, like I feel like the style of this has really kind of started to come together. I need to look at page 15 too. I think it shows the stairwell and I want to make sure I'm being consistent. It's, it's going to be a little bit later in the day than when she receives the letter. But, uh, but I do think it'll be helpful to like, for consistency's sake to, here we go. I'll have to pull open page 15 too. So here's page 15. Oh my goodness. I thought it was page 15. There we go. Didi said, I bet Benji was glad you were home. Yeah, so um, Benji and Mai were uh, in Utah, and so we picked them up from the airport um, this Saturday. and it was, So that was uh, yesterday. And yeah, um, Ben was utterly stoked to be home. Um, I was really happy to have him back home. Obviously, it's it's nice to have uh, you. You miss your kid when you're when you're when they're gone for a little bit. And they were kind of doing like a family visit um, and taking care of some some uh, some sort of crisis situations out there. Um, so it's it it was really nice to like get them uh, pick them up from the airport and like see you know, see my kid because they had been out uh, about a week before uh, I left for TCAF. They were um, visiting family. And so, yeah, so it's been really nice to have them back uh, back in the house. Um, I think yesterday was our first book time that we had done um, in a while. So, yeah, it definitely is nice to have Ben back. 
that's another reason why I haven't uh, live streamed in a while either was just trying to do crunch time and get as much done uh, before before they got back um, as possible. And then yesterday, like I just kind of hung with Benjamin for a lot of the day. So. But yeah, it's it is really nice um, for anybody who's a parent. You guys would understand that it's like when your kids eight, it's hard to go like a couple days without your kid, much less like a couple weeks. That's that was a that was an interesting thing. I did a blog really recently or a vlog, I guess, um, talking about uh, death informing art. And I think Gary and I are going to do hopefully a, a deeper conversation about that on one of his future um, episodes. We were initially thinking, oh, cool, we'll do that on um, on next Saturday. But uh, but then I realized, like, wait a minute. This Saturday, I have um, a signing at Barnes & Noble uh, from 2 to 5, which would definitely not work for the... Uh, being on Gary's stream. So we're going to try for like the week after that to have a more in-depth conversation about uh, the sort of heavier topic, um, which I, I think is a really valid and important topic, but, um, but it's definitely like, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of weirder, um, harder to talk about topic, but I, but I feel like uh, Gary and I can navigate it and, uh, get into some really interesting stuff. So I'm also not sure why, but my Wacom tablet kind of keeps freezing. So I might have to quit out of, we'll find out. Yep. I'm going to have to quit out before doing that. Let's try doing something to save the selections I've made so far. So I'm going to make these magenta. And then we'll quit out. So at least I don't have to re deselect those, those spots. Okay. So I'm going to quit out. Oh wait, maybe I don't need to. Suddenly, my Wacom tablet appears to be working, so maybe that'll. Maybe it was just a matter of saving. We'll see. If it continues to lag, you guys can let me know. <laughs> One of the hard things about working digitally is uh, every once in a while you have, you know, digital stuff comes up. I think that's the official term for it, is digital stuff. But occasionally there's little delays, which is why it's so important when you're. Um, like I used to say this a bunch when I teach digital art, like just the fact that like, hey, you want to be saving like all the time, you know. Um, and you can warn like a young artist like only so many times, but all it takes to really learn that lesson is like you don't save for a while and then like you lose like half your work that you've been working on for eight hours or something. Um, yeah. So anyhow, if you guys are out there and you're going to start working digitally, uh, save often. There's a dog in the background who's freaking out. DD said, I only use uh, procreate you and Corey rock the Photoshop. Yeah, I still haven't messed with Procreate yet. I keep hearing really good things about it, and um, I'm going to have to mess with it at some point. You know? I think Corey's a fan of Procreate as well. I think I might be the last holdout. Um, I, I definitely feel like... Uh, I feel like once I try it, I might have to just switch over entirely. It's a very serious dog you guys are hearing behind you. Oh, Corey chimed in saying, I hate Procreate. There we go. So I think 
Corey uses Fresco, and then what are the um, what are the iPad uh, programs that you've been using? Was it Sketchbook Blah Blah Blogins? I think that's what it is. Corey, why don't you just let, let us know what programs? I have the problem of uh, when it comes to like iPad programs, my brain becomes like a very old man using Quark Express for book layout kind of mentality. Not that I'm using Quark Express. I definitely use InDesign, but I knew some guys that were older men that were working in my industry who would swear by like um, by Quark Express for book layout and uh, just refused, absolutely refused to learn InDesign. And then uh, the whole industry shifted. And usually the Quark guys were really big on a, a program called Corel Draw. And um, I remember just thinking, why not just learn the new program? And now I'm that guy um, with other stuff. So, But I will say if it starts dominating the industry, um, I will... I will very reluctantly start learning the new programs but i just find adobe still like so seamless and uh relatively quick but then again i might be fooling myself it might be uh slower i don't know you guys will have to let me know in the chats it's one of the advantages of being in the chats this is so nuts that um yeah that my memory Whoa, I'm not even touching the screen right now. And uh, my memory is freaking out on my computer. It's not happy, you guys. That was not happy about my selections. So what was cool was uh, Ben is now getting really into like building full out Lego sets. Oh my gosh. Why is my Wacom... Hold on, guys. Um, he's getting really into like building like full Lego sets like on his own without the need for dad to help. And uh, that's like a really kind of amazing thing. He used to get these, you know, big Lego sets. And then like anytime he'd get a Lego set, you know, it would basically mean dad's going to have to build this whole Lego set. And um, and then like you'll help out a little bit, you know. Uh, it's finally transitioned over where even when I was like going to help him, um, he's like, no, dad, I got this. <laughs> but it was pretty cute. So he had gotten a couple Lego sets while he was in Utah and then uh, had to unbuild them, uh, you know, for, for the travel back. Um, and when he got back here, he just rebuilt like all his Lego sets, just like no problem. It's pretty amazing. Um, that's it. Okay. Corey said Photoshop fresco and I used to use sketchbook. I'm not a painter, but I feel like it's made for painters. I hate all the hidden stuff gestures. Yeah. I still, I still am like a huge Adobe guy, but, um, but I know a, a lot of people who like really dig procreate. I think it's, uh, is it Scott who uses Procreate? Oh my gosh. Now my brain is just mush when it comes to like who uses what. But anyhow, it was fun to see. It's just kind of neat to see the different kind of phases of like a kid's development. And Benji's definitely at that phase where he can build a pretty complicated Lego set and follow the directions and, you know, pretty much arrive with like a really good product. Um, and there's a part of me that like was a little sad about that. Cause it's like, to be honest, it's kind of fun to have the excuse of building a Lego set, you know, for your kid. You're like, oh yeah, I got to help you with this rather than, you know, in all honesty, it's just kind of fun to build a really crazy Lego set. <laughs> um, let's see. 
yeah so that's it Corey said scott uses uh procreate and also jim so anyhow it's been an interesting uh an interesting return back to normal but i don't know if you guys have that after international travel just like that whole um, I don't do it a lot, so I, I was very surprised by like how much that like takes you out for a little bit. Um, but I will say I've also been actively vlogging more, and that's been really fun, especially for the days where I'm going to be working on pencils, and I don't like streaming while I pencil. And so I feel like um, for people who follow my channel, um, hopefully that'll be another way for you guys to kind of like hear what's going on and for me to talk about different topics in art and uh you know basically hopefully generate more content you know Corey, how is your stuff coming along i saw a um animation like a a rooster it it looked like you had illustrated um it's it's like a loose but very cool animation and then Corey said i animate in after effects there isn't a good ipad alternative but there's good stuff for rotoscoping that's cool Uh, Didi said, some Legos are like building actual spaceships and buildings. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Lego sets are a lot different from when I was a kid, where I think it was like, they had like just released the Lego techniques. And those were like the really crazy, complicated ones to build. But in general, it was like, most Lego kits weren't, you know, quite as complicated as the ones now. But yeah, you're right. There's definitely like there were a couple that I wonder if he'd be able to build on his own. There um there is uh now I'm blinking out on the show name. What was the name of the show? There's like a show with oh, Ninjago. Um and Ninjago had like like its own little kits and sets. And some of them are like these um, really complicated like dragons and stuff. And like to build them is like really pretty and in pretty intense um, for like just following Lego instructions kind of building. And I wonder like those are ones where I wonder like watching Ben build these sets. I was like, I think he could do it. But if he's going to struggle with the set, that would be probably you know the one he'd be struggling with at this point so i think this is correct i hope i'm not doing the wrong deselection here because i think this is the maid skirt this is a bit of a um kind of humorous panel here too So right here is like, it's sort of a slapstick panel where Wilson is carrying this really heavy luggage. They're sneaking out downstairs. So it's meant to have like a little bit of humor to it. That's it, the laser rooster, because it like opens its mouth and shoots a laser. But that is rough that, um, yeah, Corey, I'm glad you're somewhat on the mend because I feel like every, uh, for the last year, it feels like Corey keeps getting hit with these immense curveballs that take him out of action for a little bit. And the amazing thing as a testament to just like Corey's strength of character is he'll still 
be super productive and, and still get like a ton of work done. And I frankly am like baffled by how he's able to, to kind of manage. Yeah. Didi said, I know, right, Josh. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to do the maids. I think I'm going to do the maids. Um, let's see. Are we going to see your eyes? Do we see her eyeballs at all? Oh, we do. Oh, my goodness. almost forgot to deselect this. I don't know if you guys are hearing the uh, my son being a wild thing running around. He's definitely having a blast. So I'm not sure. I don't think we're seeing her eyes really. So maybe it's a matter of let's do her mouth if it's in any panels. So now we're going to get through her mouth. Dee Dee said, he sounds happy. Leave him alone. Oh, 100% going to leave him alone. He's, he's goofing around. I think there's nothing more special than like a, you know, eight-year-old just being wildly excited and having fun and running around and I don't know there's something about that age where like his imagination just um is so much fun Okay, we're going to do the eyeball color because I think we can see the eyeball color. So I want to make sure I get to that. Dee Dee said that page with the stack of books looked really good. Thank you. Yeah, that took a while. Um, it's It's funny, but like that's one of the things that has slowed my progress was like having to redraw 17 panels and also doing those pages that were like those four, eight, 12, like 16 panel pages. Um, 16 panel pages are sometimes like, I feel like, you know, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was essential for the story. Like, I feel like it needed to have 16 panels on those pages, but oh my gosh, like when it takes like 16 separate illustrations for one page to get done, that's a little rough, like for me. <laughs> worth it but still oh my gosh that was quite a bit of work i want to do her hair actually at this point okay let's do some hair Corey said, I laid in a hospital bed for a week without enough strength to do anything. It sucked. Being productive isn't impressive. It's infinitely better than the alternative. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I think when you're unable to work on stuff, it, there, there's, there's, as a creative, there's hardly anything out there that's going to be as frustrating as that would be. And then, it, you know, I think Corey and I are cut from a little bit of the same cloth as creatives. We've talked about this, too, where it's like we've always found it strange when there are people who are out there who are creatives who don't, like, feel this just immense drive to be working on stuff all the time. It's kind of a weird thing about, I think, our personalities. So we're doing her hair now. Not sure how I didn't get Elizabeth's eyes and teeth back there. That's crazy. I have to go back and do that too.
Oh, that's a good point. Didi was saying that's where like videos are really nice when like when you can't be super actively creative, but you can at least kind of listen to somebody being creative. Um, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, I've definitely had like a bit of a roller coaster um, of a week this week. But if I think about, you know, the roller coaster that Corey's been on, uh, it makes the roller coasters I've been going through seem like very minor things. Um, Okay, I think I got all the panels with her hair in them. I want to go back to the white again because I missed her eyes and teeth here. And Elizabeth kind of needs to have eyes and teeth. That's a good thing to have. You guys might disagree, maybe. You like your characters without eyes and teeth. Um, but for me, I think it's like a it's a good benefit to a character. Kind of humanizes them a little bit. Dee Dee said, if I can't sleep and wake up in the middle of the night, some of you late nighters are on. Yeah, I've actually been finding that really fun with live streams. Um, when I watch live streams myself, it's usually if I'm like, if I'm working on something that I don't like want to stream while I'm doing it, um, particularly like penciling, I just I'm not going to be in the mood or zone to like be able to be interacting with people or like really be on point. Um, but when, it, you know, sometimes when I'm in doing that kind of work, it's really fun for me to like tune into somebody else's stream. Um, I've definitely had that happen during the day with Gary's streams as well. So you'll notice that my wife, her ringtone is Magnum P.I.'s theme song. Just thought I'd mention that. Which I think is pretty rad. I don't know if I've told you guys. You'll have to let me know if I've told you guys the story of how my wife got into it, Magnum P.I. And not like the remake. I, I've heard they like somehow rebooted the show. We're not talking about that. We're talking classic 1980s Tom Selleck Magnum P.I. That Magnum P.I. You guys can let me know in the chats if I've told you that story. So we're just getting all the skin tones deselected real quick of the maid i'm pretty sure i chose the same tone for elizabeth but it won't hurt to kind of double check that this was a fun panel to lay out i know it's weird but i love doing things like where you have like the background kind of show through okay there was another little area of white that I missed that I want to get back to. <laughs> Corey said little orphan Annie style with no eyes. And then Dee Dee said, ew, Corey. <laughs> um, and then she said, we were actually in Hawaii when he was making the series. When, when Magnum PI was being filmed, that's amazing. Like the, the original. That is rad, Dee Dee. Are you in the background in any like old school Magnum PI episodes that we should know of? 
Is this like the the untold truth about Dee Dee's past? Is that she was like an extra in like every Tom Selleck Magnum PI episode? If that were true, um, Dee Dee, you would be the coolest person in the world. <laughs> But you're still pretty rad. But I'm just saying you'd earn like 50,000 rad points if you were actually in the original Magnum PI. So I, I don't think I've told you guys that story. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And then you can say, hey, you've told this story. Um, so when Ben was like a baby, uh, there's like this period of time. And, you know, Corey's probably go gone through this more recently than most people I know. Um but there's this point in time where your kid is way too young to do any sort of like sleep training or anything like that with. And so you're pretty much like stuck with this newborn, like up, like at odd hours in the night. And quite often you just have to like set them on your lap and burp them and rock them and maybe pat their back a little bit. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll crash, you know, but there's a lot of nights like that, like in early parenting. And so, when Benji was like that little, um, I, I had the night shift. And so like, I would be, you know, it'd be like two in the morning and I'd have Ben in at the time we were in like a two bedroom apartment. So I'd have him in like the little second bedroom office that we had. And I would just put on random TV shows and watch entire seasons until you know, Ben fell asleep and he was too young to like really even know what was on, you know? So it's like that, that weird sweet spot era that anybody who's had a kid is familiar with, um, where you can pretty much watch whatever, but you know, your kid is just needs the company of you. And like, they need you to kind of occasionally like burp them or like, you know, rock them and kind of help them get back to bed. Um, so anyhow, I was I, I was perusing like Netflix and noticed, oh my gosh, they have every episode of Magnum PI, like the original Magnum PI, which was awesome to me because as a kid, I just I thought Magnum PI was like the coolest dude on the planet. I, I as a little kid, I used to have a Hot Wheel that was like a Ferrari, um, and it was it, you know I specifically picked out that Ferrari because it looked like Magnum PI's Ferrari. And uh, I just, I loved that show. And re-watching it, I was like, well, of course I love that show. It was like running around, driving fast cars, and like shooting guns at each other. And a lot of the logic of that show is very much like kid logic, like the way kids would be like, okay, now there's this thing, and it's it's like a bunch of action movie logic that's very childlike. Um, so I rewatched all of them. And then I remember one night my came in and was like, what have you been watching? And I kind of explained to her Magnum PI and, and, um, she was like, what's Magnum PI? And I was like, what's Magnum PI? <laughs> so I kind of told her that story that I just told you. And then I had her watch like one or two episodes. And then before you know it, my wife became more obsessed with Magnum PI than me and um she is like probably the biggest magnum pi fan now of like i think anyone in the world like she absolutely loves that show so that is how my wife got into magnum pi um and i think that's pretty incredible and cool and then uh Dee, Dee said, I modeled only a couple of TV uh, extras. Oh, so she was an extra, but uh, but not Magnum. Um, and then Dee, Dee said, his shorts make me crazy. Did men ever really wear those short shorts? Seems more dangerous <laughs> than his job. I think, I don't know. I mean, I might be crazy, but I kind of think like... Um, I think that's like part of why my wife might secretly like that show is Magnum shorts. Um, Cause from what my wife has said, I think she thinks Tom Selleck is very handsome or was very handsome. 
which I can't really blame her because, like I said, as a kid, I was I thought he was the bee's knees, you know. All right, so let's see here. Now we're going to do, what color do we have to do now? Okay, we're going to do Elizabeth. Elizabeth, okay. We'll start with her eyeballs. Or we could Little Orphan Annie it. Who knows? Yeah, um, Corey was mentioning with the short shorts. They did. My grandpa never stopped wearing them. Yeah, when I was a kid, I do remember men. Like, a lot of men wore really short shorts. It's like a weird, it was, it was a, it was the hip thing from that era. It was like, I think that around the time that women were wearing jeans that like cut off like right up, like right up here, <laughs> right where my like Wu-Tang symbol like stops like that, that the top of it, that's where women in a specific period of the eighties used to have their um, jeans uh, stop. Like the waist would be up there um, around that era. Men had. I think a lot of men wore short shorts. It was just sort of the thing. I still think it would be funny to do like a comic convention and wear some short shorts. And if people looked at you like, what are you doing? Just be like, what? These are my shorts. It's what I do. So, um, what would be funny is if I did that and then suddenly my sales were just like incredible. <laughs> Corey was saying, I think they were originally red in the 70s, but they faded to a flesh tone by the early 2000s. <laughs> Are you talking about the, the, the shorts, Corey? I'm confused about the red thing. Because I do remember, as a, so as a kid, I think I had a pair of like 80s short shorts. They were actually red, and they had little racing stripes on the side. I think like almost every little boy in the 80s had those pants. Like they were like, they had like a little V on the side. Do you know what I'm talking about? And then there's like three red lines. Or not red lines, like white stripes that were on the side of the the shorts. Am I crazy? Do you guys remember those? Yeah, they were like little... Uh, my wife pointed that out very well. They were like little basketball shorts. And like most little boys in the 80s had those that specific style of short. Girls too, yeah. Girls, I think, had incredibly short shorts. Stripe on the side and Notch yep. Those, and they were like nylon. Like PE shorts or something. Yeah. It's hard to explain, but yeah. If if you know, you know. I thought a lot of us had those. Oh, uh, Corey clarified his grandpa's shorts. He ran three miles every day in them. When I was in high school, it just looked like a naked seven to five year old running through town. <laughs> <laughs> that's an amazing story Corey. and also that's a grandfather doing his job the dogs are freaking out because we have food being dropped off so bear with me guys I think I know it's very thrilling to hear a bunch of dogs barking. 
you can kind of hear the dynamic with them too like scotch is my um my wife's sister's dog and he's a cute little chihuahua but he is like one of those dogs that like seems like he just growls and gets really crazy about everything. Um, but he's like, it's, it's all kind of a front. Like that's how he is as a dog. But it's funny when you hear the dogs flip out, like you'll hear him particularly sounding super aggressive and you have to realize he is a teacup chihuahua. So he is this tiny little, um, little dude but he usually will quite often be the one to sound like the most aggressive of all of the dogs that's that's the one right there <laughs> and he's like a real softy like at the end of the day but he's just like i think you know for some reason i think people just bred those dogs like way too small so he's just constantly in fear um, he's like some neighbors I have that drive like giant trucks and then you look at them and they're like a foot tall and you're like, oh, okay, that's why you're driving a giant truck. They're, they're just kind of compensating. Um, he's like that, but, but the dog version. So if he were a person, he would be, you know, Wearing like wrap around Ray Bans. Probably have an immense gun collection. <laughs> but just a heart of gold, you know? I'm just being a goofball. I don't know, you guys. I don't know. I'm here all night. But anyhow, Scotch is cute. He's a funny dog. And he grows on you, that little dog. He grows on you very, very much. All right, so we're getting there. We've got... Uh... Oh, Dee Dee asked me to ask Mai if she ever watched Jesse Stone. I will have to ask her. Is that a Tom Selleck thing? Because if it is, uh, and she hasn't watched it, she might just end up watching that tonight. So now we're doing the skin tone. Hey, Mai. Yeah. Dee Dee wanted to know if you've watched Jess Stone or Jesse Stone. Um, I see, saw some of it. It's it's pretty. It's okay. Kind of reminds me of Law and Order. Is that Tom Selleck? Yeah. Okay. Is um, that like the Blue Blood thing? Yeah. Okay. I think so. He, he's like a cop. Well, he's not. I don't know if he's a cop actually. But I think he's in a family of cops. Okay, I thought that was Blue Bloods. Oh, maybe I may have Blue Bloods. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I saw. Not Jesse Stone. Okay, so I don't think my wife's seen Jesse Stone, unless I'm crazy and maybe that's not called Blue Bloods. But she has seen Blue Bloods, but... Oh, uh, Dee Dee said it's a, it was a series of uh, made-for-TV movies. He's a small town cop. So we'll have to check that out. I kind of like the way you're describing that, Dee Dee, because it almost sounds like a, um, you know, the lyrics to like Shaft or something, where it's like Jesse Stone, he's a small town. You know, it's got like a song or something that talks about him being a. Small town cop. It's a stretch. I know. Is 
See, even that, like she was saying, was a big city cop, had bad things happen, moved to a small town. That sounds like, it still sounds to me like a, like the theme song for Shaft, you know? Was a big city cop, had bad things happen, something, I don't know. She said she saw the innocent man, which was good. Okay, so most of this is blue, but I need the... Okay, we're going to get the the gold kind of emblem -y thing. It's at the top of the dress. That's what this is officially called, an emblem -y thing. I think that's what they call it in fashion. Okay. Now we're going to get... A little more detail. All right. Well, this guy is just I also to... just realized, like, I don't know if this is on the final, but I need to correct those those gloves. Let's try That's not right. Okay, so I'm going to deselect this, and now I'm going to check something on page 18. Because I think I'm, uh, maybe it was 17. I'm going to have to look at that and see if that was on the old version. Yes, I found a missing color fill. <clears throat> How dare I? You guys see this? lack of lack of professionalism here all right so here we go we're gonna correct some of that that was an error on a previous page cool So now we can actually correct that. And I think there were a couple things missed here because I also somehow didn't catch this. This is one of the beauties of... Uh, Pulling color from previous pages, you can actually catch uh, previous page errors. You need to get those eyeballs color filled too. Look at that, much better, okay. Whew! Dee Dee said, those books look amazing. The highlights and the shadows. Thank you. Yeah, and that was like, that's a part of the book where hopefully it'll give people a hint of like what Elizabeth had accomplished. And they're mostly designed based on kind of an amalgamation of all of, of the editions that were out um, by Elizabeth at that time. Okay. So I'm going to finish uh, doing the flats for the dress. And then I'm going to take my little break and play a trailer for Let's see, what should I? I'll play a trailer for Jacob's apartment. And if you guys are in the Southern California area, um, 
and you want to get a copy of Jacob's apartment, possibly signed or with a drawing within it by me, I will be doing a signing at Barnes and Noble from one to five o'clock PM at Palmdale Barnes and Noble on Saturday. This coming Saturday. So that should be pretty fun. And then I believe after the fact, we might be going to a microbrewery in the area called Bravery Brewing. And uh, celebrating the release of Jacob's apartment. So yeah, if you're local to Southern California, it's a good way to support the book, support my work, and also hopefully have a good uh, Saturday, you know? Dee Dee said, I forgot to check Barnes & Noble when I was there last weekend to see if they had it because I already have it. Awesome. Yeah, actually, I mean, one thing you can do um, is, you know, the next time you're at Barnes & Noble, just say, hey, I have this book. You guys should carry it, you know. It's a, a good way to help retailers. So if it's not already there, uh, you know, it's a good way to say, hey, order this book. But I also, I very much appreciate that you've already picked up the book and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, We have one more dress to go after this. And then the Jacob's apartment trailer, which awaits you all. <laughs> but I got to say, like, um, it feels good to be back to live streaming. It's fun to get back to this format. I am enjoying doing the vlogs too. Um, and I'm going to try to kind of keep up with those more often. I definitely feel like vlogging in particular is one of those things where you can kind of get on a roll where you're just, you make it a part of your routine. But like for me, um, it's not hard to do as long as you kind of stay consistent with it and kind of stay in a rhythm with it. But the second I stop, it's really hard for me to get back in the flow of vlogging. Um, similar to live streaming, honestly. I think these things are always like much easier um, when you kind of get in the zone and, and actually do do it quite frequently because then you just build it into your routine. Um, but I will say... I've been really enjoying um, doing the vlogs and uh, I think it's a fun way to kind of show people a little bit behind the curtain, some of the process. Um, it's a way to kind of generate content when I would otherwise just be like commuting. And, uh, and I think it's a fun way to kind of keep in touch with you guys too. So I don't know, that's something I, I think I'll keep up with, but I will say there's something unique about live streaming that I really enjoy um, that I've missed for the few days that I haven't been able to do it. Um, it was fun too. Like even at TCAF, I met a couple people who watched the live streams and a couple who were like, they tune in like most of the live streams and don't really chime in, you know, in the chats or anything like that, but they just like having it in the background when they're working. And, uh, that was really encouraging and cool to kind of, put faces to names and also to even hear from some people who like, you know, I didn't know were listeners, you know, um, <clears throat> like that's always fun, I think. So 
that was a pleasant surprise finding all that out um okay so real quick what i will do is i'm going to color the dog um we'll do the dog's nose color first and we'll get to coloring that dog in a few minutes but i'm going to put on the trailer because we've hit the hour mark oh dd said i have gary's two books read the first one um very on edge yeah they're they're so good um and then uh dd said i read so much i have piles at all times and read multiple books at once i love watching the process of your book josh and your vids from the convention were fun watching the art casters with Corey in the hospitals had me biting my nails yeah me too had all of us biting our nails we've Corey's had us biting our nails this whole year um he needs to not get in a near-death accident for at least another week okay Corey? um all right, so I'm going to put on the trailer uh, for Jacob's apartment, and I will be back, and we're going to finish flatting this page come hell or high water. All right, here we go. Speak clearly. So I'm pretty sure I've colored the dog's eyes. Let's see what I colored them. Oh, I need to actually save that one page too. I think it was page 15. We need to save that because that's much better. No, it wasn't page 15. It was page, page 18. Got it. Good. Okay, we're going to just save this. Wait, no, this wasn't it. What was the page with the books that we were so interested in? Ah, here we go. That is the page. Okay, I'm just going to save that because we did fix that page. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to get into the dog, but I need to color the dog appropriately. So yes, okay, his eyeballs and his nose are the same brown. That is good to know. So we're going to go through and deselect his nose and his eyeballs. Exciting times, you guys. This is the thrilling and exciting nonstop adventure hour that is called Flatting Comics. I warn you, viewer discretion is advised. This can be intense and uh graphic and violent as the process is going i'm definitely being sarcastic there uh flat coloring is a very slow methodical not super exciting thing 
but I appreciate uh, those of you who like watching the process. Um, and I like the company. It's fun to have company while I'm working on stuff. Speaking of working on stuff, um, what are you guys working on? I'm kind of curious to know and hear what everybody who is presently watching the stream <clears throat> is working on. And if you're watching this after the fact, let me know in the chats like what uh, you guys are busy working on. Didi said, it's all interesting to me. I don't do sequential art, so it is cool to watch. Yeah, sequential art is an interesting beast. It is... It is definitely its own kind of thing. And it's funny, too, because um, I, I think I've told you guys, like, my wife has had just, like, an incredible year when it comes to, like, different projects coming up and different possibilities coming up. Um, and uh, she went through with me, like, the the stuff that she has on her plate right now for kids books. And it's exciting, but it's like, it's insane. I, I don't know how she's keeping up with the workflow. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I've I feel like it's just been one of those years where like, we're just being provided with a lot of opportunities and, and somehow managing to kind of get through sort of intense workloads you know um now this dog's collar has not been on in any of the previous panels and so i can actually color it whatever color works i think the emblem will be the same gold as the emblem on elizabeth's dress because a good rule of thumb with color is is like especially when you're working with limited colors like this um where it's mostly going to be flat color and uh a lot of this is like mimicking i'm forgetting the term and uh i feel like i feel like gary kind of nailed it whatever that term is um for this old form of uh, coloring um, where you would have sort of like a stat cammed um, or like an etching and then it would be like toned. Um, that's sort of the look that I'm trying to go for for this since it takes place in Victorian England. But when you're doing this, it's like uh, what I do try to do to kind of make the colors not feel like rainbows just threw up everywhere. <laughs> Um, when you have access to all the colors in the rainbow, that can happen is like to limit my palettes. And if I bring in a color and I can repeat it somewhere else, I'm going to do that. Um, so things like that gold, like I probably want to carry it throughout the page, um, in more than just one spot. So it doesn't feel out of place. And it's funny because there is like a compositional rule of threes where pages tend to look better when they're composed like within one third of the space on the page. Um, so if you kind of like are taking a photograph or something of a, um, a landscape and you show like the sky as like the top two thirds and then the bottom third is like the landscape. Um, or vice versa, it, it just has more of a sense of beauty to it if you can kind of divide it into thirds. But there's also, I think, a rule of threes with color, where if you have color appear and it's in three separate sections of an image, it kind of helps the image work, and it helps the color kind of sit on the page. Whereas if you just have one color in one spot, it can feel like very out of place and weird. And I just realized I'm not talking to anyone on the stream, so I actually don't have to wear these headphones. So I'm going to take them off. Cool. Those headphones are gone. 
Dee Dee said, I was glad to be able to get one of my books. It was the last one available through a secondary seller. Oh, Dee Dee also said, I am um, doing a portrait commission and a 24 by 30 collage. And I posted a Barbie doll in my garden this morning. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, um, I think that that book you're talking about, Dee Dee, is probably The Moon and the Night Sweeper. And uh, that was like a book my wife did. It was one, I, I think, one of, if not her first children's book. And uh, that one she wrote and illustrated. And it is hard to get a hold of a copy of that. Um, and then Mai did say she has copies if anyone's interested. So I would say, you know, maybe reach out. Like if somebody ever wants to get a hold of Moon in the Night Sweeper, maybe you wanted it signed or something like that to uh, reach out to Mai and kind of see if you can get a hold of one. Um, but yeah, uh, the um, she has quite a few books that she's illustrated, like on Amazon. There's a whole ton of them. And I'm at, I think we're pretty excited because it sounds like she might be doing another book. Um, she did my what's the name of the elf book? Yeah, she did this beautifully illustrated Christmas book called Festival of the Elves. And uh, it's really well illustrated. And her client was really cool for that. And I think that writer might be having her do another thing, I think. So that should be a really fun project because I think for illustrators, you know, like out there, um, when you have a really good client, you know, with who budgets and like gives you a lot of creative freedom, trust your process, like it goes really a, an incredibly long way. And I feel like that book in particular is just a really good example of that, like where just a really good client, you know, and um, a really fun project, a cute, cute idea, like just overall pretty good. Okay, let's see here. I need to do something for the mouth, too, because this is a lot of open mouths, and I don't know if I've shown um, Flush the dog with an open mouth yet in this story. I'm trying to think for the leash too, like what color will we make the leash? Yeah, Dee Dee, you're definitely dead on. Like it's 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 a um I believe the publisher for Moon in the Night Sweeper is 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 no longer in existence so it's like it is a little hard to get a hold of um and that's cool you were able to you know because it's a cool book it's it is a really cute book We were looking over the books that she illustrated in the last few years, and it's like a pretty big stack. So we're going to do the mouse real quick, but I think you're right, Dee Dee. It's, it's probably going to be a leather leash.
I think we've got the dog's mouth there. And then we need to save because it's been a while since I've saved. And I did that whole rant about saving. Did they have a lot of dyed leather then? I don't think they did. I mean, I think it, it you know, they definitely had more dyed, you know, materials. But I do think you're probably right. That's probably a safe bet. But I also want to make sure it's something that fits well with the composition. So maybe it's like a... I cancel that. Let's see. So I'm trying to think of like what would work best for this leather. I think you're entirely right, Dee Dee. And I think I might go with like that. But I also don't want it to be too in competition with. There we go. That'll work. But I think they might have had colored leashes at that point, too, because, you know, it's the 1800s, so it's like they definitely had very colorful fabrics and stuff like that, but... But I do think a leather leash for a dog, because I, I think unless you were, like, royalty at the time or something, you may not be, like, you know using a material like i'm not sure if the materials it would be interesting to look up victorian dog leashes but i just don't frankly have the time <laughs> so this one will just make the safe bet of leather because i think you're right on that <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting closer. We have our characters. Now we need our luggage. And there's only one piece of this luggage that we've shown so far. And that is this. And I believe that's going to have two colors to it. I think there's a better shot of it on page 18, maybe? Yes. Okay. Page 18 is showing the color of that. And I believe we're going to show it on here, but I think it's the top of the stack. So this is going to have, that's going to be the coloring of the edges and the latches on the top bag. The other bags can be colored whatever the heck we want to color them. handle is going to be this discolored bit too. Nice. Dee Dee said I looked it up and they're a reddish brown, so maybe we're correct. I wonder if I should make that a little more red. Thank you, Dee Dee, for doing that. That's awesome. That's one of my favorite things about working on this historical fiction stuff when I'm 
doing live streams too is like I can kind of crowdsource it a little bit too, which is nice. So that often can be really cool. So far, I feel like the research has done me pretty well, except for that specific dress. Like that was the one scenario so far where I've been pretty off on like what she was probably historically wearing. Although again, like she did own that dress that I had drawn her in. So that's cool. Um, Cause I did end up finding a picture very recently that was of Elizabeth Barrett Browning in that white dress, but it was just like when she was much younger. Um, so it wasn't a bad call for us to change it to this kind of more, more Elizabeth Barrett when she's like at the stage where she's meeting Robert. And at this point, she's, I think, in her like 30s and Robert is in his 20s, from what I recall. And uh, there's almost like a 10 year difference. So she's definitely kind of cradle Robin a little bit when it comes to pursuing Robert. I'm, I'm kind of joking about the cradle robbing. She's not really cradle robbing, but there is a bit of a, a difference, and she's definitely pursuing a younger man. So. But what's funny is, like, to me, the fact that, like, every depiction of her is, like, her as this helpless, like, in, in existing pop culture, is her as this helpless, like, damsel in distress who's being kind of rescued by Robert, whereas it's like kind of very much the opposite, where she very boldly pursued Robert and had a lot more agency than they kind of usually depict her as having. And I think that's actually pretty cool. Um, but she definitely wasn't like some helpless damsel. She was definitely like, you know, had her issues with like laudanum and all sorts of stuff like that. So some of that's accurate. You know, she had a very overbearing father. That's somewhat accurate, but her father wasn't like holding her prisoner as depicted in a lot of the stories. Um, and again, like Elizabeth wasn't just like kind of sitting around on a chase lounge waiting for like some dude to rescue her. That was definitely not her character. And I think that's, um, although I will say I have had to draw her on a chase lounge quite a lot. What's interesting to consider too, is like for people who've been watching this stream, like that, that section, you know, that I've been working on for like a couple months in Elizabeth Barrett Browning's room like that, if you were just reading that as a comic, it would take maybe a minute or two. <laughs> such as comics. All right. So we have the one luggage. Now we can do the other luggage. Let's rock some other luggage here, guys. Did they have metal clasps of suitcases asking for a friend? It seems like Sherlock had leather stra uh, straps that closed them. Yeah, it's a mix. They did have metal ones, um, and they did have, like, the suitcases kind of looked a little bit like the modern suitcases, but they definitely had those ones that had, like, the little slips on them, too. Um, but yes, yes, there were metal suitcases. But the ones you're talking about, actually, that very bottom one is kind of, I think, the type you're talking about. Um, Let's see. I think, like, going with a... That in mind, though, I do think most of these suitcases will be leather. I think the cheaper ones were like a faux leather. Mm. 
but I mean, you know, Elizabeth is not like some, it's interesting. It's like to a lot of the upper crust of England, I think they were considered like her and Robert were considered poor, but it's like, that was, you know, compared to all the class with title kind of people. Like it, I think, by all means they were not super poor like they had a lot of wealth in their family and um i think their choice to get married was like i think that put them in a bit of a bind because they didn't have access to a lot of the wealth that they would have otherwise inherited but i mean you know they had multiple properties across the world and uh made and you know yeah so they weren't like you know struggling so my point is they'd have like leather luggage they probably wouldn't have like the little faux cardboardy luggage that was also around at the time <laughs> Didi was saying, just don't want anyone calling you out on it. You might have to go all crumble. That's true. I feel like I need to have an alternate YouTube channel that's just crumble. And uh, that's the YouTube channel where I get into like massive controversies online. And do like crazy YouTube takedown videos of famous public figures and stuff. That's the Kremble persona there. That's what's going to have to happen. Basically, the Kremble channel would be like a an angry AM radio station where I, I would have to have like a bunch of shock jock sound effects and stuff, I think. I don't know. I'll have to ask my wife for more more tips on what I could do for my Kremble channel. See here. We're getting there, you guys. We are getting there. <laughs> yeah, Dee Dee was uh, pointing out when would I have the time to have an alternate dark persona YouTube channel? That is a fairly good question there, Dee Dee. All right, so we have... I like that tone for the bottom luggage, but I'm mainly thinking this will be the tone for the straps. and the handle. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I did look at some luggage from the era, so maybe I found the wrong thing, but I think the luggage wasn't like too severely different at, at that era in time, although they did have a lot of pullover straps and kind of weird openings. Like uh, the one that's on the top is like a top opening um, case that was, I think, from that era. But that's definitely one of those things that wasn't as different as a lot of things, because I think at the time they did have a lot of metal metal manufacturing. Um, so it's kind of weird, like the things that were different in the Victorian era are like very strange, like you have a lot of things that were similar, but then like, you know, electricity wasn't as common everywhere. Um, you know, definitely we didn't have cars, but you did have like really rad like horse carts that were like very like sleek and kind of streamlined. It's kind of, it's just a weird era in time. But uh, travel by train, I believe, was was a thing at this point. So you have a lot of like a lot of luggage. Um, I mean, obviously, they're not going to have like the hard plastic travel luggage, but it definitely like I don't think it changed too much between Victorian era and like the 40s, honestly, like the 30s and 40s. All right. Let's see here. We have done our luggage here, guys. Now, this is going to be the pain in the butt part. Where I'm going to have to do a lot of general colors. So let's see here. So here is the tone of the banister. So let's do that first. And I think I need a refill of coffee. So I'm going to refill my coffee. And we're getting closer, you guys. We're getting a lot closer. Paul said, I had a girlfriend in high school. Her name was Daphne, but she went by Dee Dee. Interesting. Paul, are you going to be finding out that Dee Dee, did you used to date a guy named Paul in high school? Let's get to the bottom of this. <laughs> I'll be right back. Um, I'm going to put on the trailer for two stories and uh, I'm going to refill my coffee to keep keep up steam. But we are getting closer, you guys. We're getting much, much closer and then Paul said, uh, looks fantastic, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right. Um, let's find. Okay, here is the trailer for two stories. The Christmas trailer. Enjoy. <laughs>
All right. We have some wonderful things happening here. Dee Dee said, Paul is probably too young. Who knows? Who knows, you guys? Okay. So we're going to do our banisters now. And slowly but surely, this page shall get finished, and then I shall eat some dinner. That's my goal here. Do you guys do that with art? Like, for me, I tend to make incentives. It'll even be something like that, where it's like, hey, I get to take a break when I reach this point. I get to eat dinner when I reach this point. I do this a lot, um, and it actually helps quite a bit. Paul, how's your uh, sci-fi comic coming along, buddy? I still have yet to read Paul's second book, and I actually have to read a graphic novel tonight that I promised my editor I would read. But I think once I'm done with that, I'm going to read um, Paul's second book because I just have really enjoyed. Um, I've really enjoyed it. The Detective Perez series is a lot of fun. Is that it for the Detective Perez books too, Paul? Or is there like a third that's on its way? I'm... I'm curious about that. Such a fun premise, you know? And I like that it kind of starts out as like a hard-boiled detective story, and then it just brings in all this vampire lore. Um, kind of in a very surprising, fun way. It's a, it's a fun series of books. I recommend it. I encourage you guys to check it out. But yeah, I'm like eager to read the uh, the next the second one. The sci-fi thing is done. It was just a cover for a board game, Paul said. And then Dee Dee did say she takes uh, small breaks and like little accomplishment breaks. Yeah, I think that's like, that's the way to stay sane when you're pacing out your workflow. To me, I think especially when you're doing sequential art, you know, and you're drawing the same background that you've drawn, you know, 50 times, to keep it fresh and interesting, you kind of almost have to like um, have little little sanity breaks, you know. But it also makes like the whole act of creating art like a lot more fun. Um, and I find that it pushes me to do more than I otherwise would. But I do know artists tend to work in one of two ways, like in a very like disciplined show up, do the work when you have time, get the thing done kind of way or in like fits and starts. And I know artists that work in both ways. I've been both. Um, and I've found that like the disciplined sort of like little micro task way is like, the the most effective that's that's worked for me but i know some people who like they'll you know 
like knock out like a whole graphic novel in like a month, you know? And just not sleep and just, they just plow through it. Um, I'm amazed by that, but I can't, I can't seem to do that. That also, I think some of it also just has to do with like your, your, you know, whatever situation you're in, you know, but it's like, I think from talking to Paul, I think he's more of the kind of disciplined type too, where it's like he has a specific time in the morning where he works on his comics and then like just carves away at them and then they get done. But, um, but I have known some artists who like, they, they just get in the mood and they knock out the entire thing. Um, super quick. That always blows me away. The ability to do that. DD said, I'm rarely in a deadline anymore either, Josh. Yeah, I I envy that a little bit. I mean, I, I do like the deadline. Like, I like the deadline um, scenario, but it's funny. Whenever you're on deadline, you definitely miss those times where you're not, you know. <laughs> but deadlines are like a, a mixed bag, you know. It's... Okay. They can be cool and they can be uh, terrifying. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. So now we're going to do the stairwell underneath. I definitely want to get that taken care of. You know what? Before we do the stairwell, let's do the floor. The floor is pretty, pretty doable here. I think there's only one panel that's showing this sort of deeper floor. The thing that's going to take forever on this page are those little paintings. There's a bunch of little paintings on the wall. Those will take a while. The uh, exterior of the building might take a while too. We'll, we'll find out. But I'm guessing the beast on here is going to be those, those paintings in the background. Stairwell. My son is giggling and he's playing some kind of game. Not quite sure what he's playing, but he is definitely giggling. And he's saying something about, I think, a horse. He's asking why the horse keeps falling apart. And I have no idea. I'm guessing there is a horse that keeps falling apart. All right. So we got some... Uh, Oh my goodness. I, I have to reselect that. We're doing our staircase here. Slowly but surely, this will get done. He said something about a horse that keeps falling apart. Not sure what horse he was talking about. Oh, he's making a horse with his magnets. That makes perfect sense.
Yeah, Didi was saying, um, I'm self-disciplined, so I get work done timely, and I don't need to take on work I don't want like to do. Yeah. I think that's, again, like most artists I know that are, you know, because Didi, I think you're very successful at what you do. And it's like, I think that um, most artists I meet that are very successful at what they do tend to be very self-disciplined. And uh, and like I said, the, the artists I know that are successful that work on like things in fits and starts, it's a very small group of people because in general... I think most people don't work well that way. I think most artists like need that um, thing you're talking about, you know, where it's like um, the discipline, like the self-discipline approach. I think that's pretty much most, most artists I think have to do that. I, I definitely am not one of the artists that can work in fits and starts. I think when I was younger and like first starting out, that was more, possibly my thought on it you know where i thought like oh that's how art goes you know and then i had to kind of learn the hard way that like art is just like everything else you know where it's it's a lot of work and just like any job or or work of any kind you kind of have to just do the work like there's rarely like some kind of big trick behind it or waiting for inspiration kind of thing behind it um so i definitely I would definitely think that would probably be true for you for, for sure, Didi. Um, all right. So did I do the, is the ceiling showing in this at all? Okay. So it doesn't look like the ceiling is showing, but the, uh, the walls are definitely all this kind of like, yellowy gold so that could translate to the ceiling too i'm guessing maybe we did show the ceiling hold on we did show the ceiling okay the ceiling is the same color so that makes this real simple um we just need to deselect all of these. Paul said, I've been taking on long commissions lately and just blowing the deadlines terribly. I'm done with commissions and deadlines. I'll do small one picture commissions, but no more big stuff yet. I, you know, I mean, I do commercial art on a deadline. Um, and then most stuff, I, I just don't tend to take work now that I don't like outside of like my day job, you know? My day job provides me with enough like kind of commercial art, drawing stuff I don't want to draw. And I'm okay with that. Like, you know, that provides for like a decent living and, you know, covers like my base needs. But yeah, I, I've, similar to I think you guys gotten to a point um, in my career where I don't really... I used to seek out a lot of like illustration work and client work. And now it's more like I have that base level covered. And so like beyond just my base needs, I'd rather make these kind of weird artsy comics that, you know, three people read. Um, although I honestly, like, I have a good feeling about this book. Um, this book I'm working on, I think is going to be, I think it's going to do really well. Um, it's a really strong script. Uh, my sister is a very strong writer and, uh, and it's just kind of cool. I don't remember where I started this selection path. That is a problem. Oh, there we go. Let's see if this works. Hey, look at that. That did work. Yay. Thought I had lost my selection there. I was like, no, I'm going to have to start over. Okay. But yeah, I think um, I think if you can manage to do that and just like make art that you want to make, um, that's great. That's kind of the ideal situation. 
I definitely look forward to some time in the future, you know, being in a position where I can just do these comics. Um, as much, I, I really enjoy art directing though. So, but I'm sure there will come a time, you know, in my future where I might just be kind of done with that sort of thing. Um, for now, you know, I'm pretty content with like anything that'll sort of provide a scenario where I can have time to work on the art I want to work on. And I've said this a million times on my channel, but it's like my theory on art is if you are able to make a living doing creative work of any kind, you are cheating the system and succeeding at something that is close to impossible to do. So congratulations. Like even when I, you know, I've had like students and stuff in the past that ask for like tips and advice on like making it as a creative and it's hard. It's like, I can't back plan I think the tough part of it, and, you know, Paul and Didi, you guys can probably attest to this. It's like if you give somebody your path there and they followed it to a T, it's not like it would magically work that way for them. I don't know if that makes sense. It's not it, it, like the tough part about creative is it's not like getting like a nursing certificate or, you know, like... um or even like a law degree or something where it's like, there's a kind of preset path, you get your degree and then you do this thing and you apply for this institution. And it's like way less um, rote the way that it's all laid out in creative. And so it's really hard to tell anyone like what's going to work for them. Cause like if they tried to follow my path, like, I don't know if that would magically lead them to being an art director or to having published work or anything like that. Cause my path's a lot different. There, there are some commonalities though. I think like, you know, for anyone who worked in creative, like being hungry, like chasing it out, like, um, finding ways in, like finding the career that works for you and like, just consistently pushing like to get in there and like to improve your portfolio. There's like common through lines that I think anyone working in creative could be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That definitely is, is part of, you know, I think most people's like success stories or whatever, but it's like, it, it is a tough thing. Like, and I don't envy people who are starting. Although I do kind of, because I think part of the fun of a creative career too is like that it's very much like the wild west and that can be really fun. Um, so it, it's sort of weird. It's got like a downside because it's not as like written down and clear and, um, is what I'm saying making any sense? I hope it's making sense. It's just, I don't think it's like as easy it's not like a step-by-step -step process, but I think for creatives, that's also kind of cool, like, um, and creative, like you almost have to be creative in like your approach to like finding work. You know, my wife found kids book art and work in a much different way than I found my freelance work and, uh, and so on. It's like, it's just different for everybody. And like your path is kind of different. The one thing that is like the common through line, I think is just that like, again, just like that weird, almost like a stubbornness where you're just not going to give up. Like you, you won't take no for an answer. You're gonna, you're gonna do creative for a living. I don't know. I don't know if any of that's making any sense, but, um, Paul says, I have no idea what it takes to be successful. I just do it. I'm compelled. Yeah, for sure. There's that too, where it's like, um, and honestly, there's also just the reality, like for me, um, I also just like, I, you know, and I know we all reach this point in life, but even if I wanted to do something else, I couldn't like, I just, I, this is what I do. 
you know it's just kind of what i do and so i definitely relate to that paul for sure where it's like 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 it or not like this is just something i do and like i'm lucky if i can do it you know for for money you know because even if there were no money involved i think i'd be doing the same thing that's you know that's the weird part So there's that too. And I think maybe that's a common thread with, with creatives too. Um, my Wacom's not reading again. Maybe it'll, okay, there it goes. Okay. It seems to be back. I've just realized I have a very temperamental uh, Wacom tablet. Paul said, I want to retire. <laughs> I I look forward to at some point retiring if that's possible. I don't know if I'll ever be in a scenario where that'll be possible. The funny thing is, like, with um, most artists I know, like, we want to retire so we can do art. <laughs> like, it's one of the weirdest careers because even people in creative, like, I don't know if you ever fully want to like, I, I don't meet a lot of creatives who are just like, I want to retire from like making books. Like it's usually the opposite where they're like, I want to retire from making other people's books so I can make my own books. Like it's, which again, I think makes like what, what we do pretty cool and special, you know? Cause again, like, how many people have that where they're like, I want to quit my job so I can do my job. You know, it's a, it's a very strange, I don't know. Frank's in the chats. How's it going, Frank? He said, speaking of hungry, I had a bacon wrapped hot dog. Delicious. That's uh, called an LA dog. And uh, thank you. Or I should say you're welcome uh, because I live in Los Angeles County and we invented that hot dog. So uh, yeah. Is that a bold statement? Because I think it's a true statement. I believe the Los Angeles, the official hot dog of Los Angeles is a bacon wrapped street dog. And then uh, my wife being my wonderful wife just snuck in and said she still prefers a Chicago dog. It's funny, my wife and I have different tastes. I'm definitely an L.A. street dog kind of guy. Um, and I, I like, you know, ketchup on my hot dogs. But my wife has definitely got, like, some kind of subconscious Chicago in, in, inside of her because she, again, like, she'll just do mustard. And, like, she's, like, pickles, mustard, like, that's her jam which is very Chicago. And it's funny because I have a lot of family from Chicago, but it's like, I, again, I don't know. Like both my wife and I's dads were born in uh, Illinois. Actually, no, uh, her dad was born in Illinois. My dad was born in Indiana. Oh, nice. Um, Paul said, uh, wait, uh, Frank was asking what his rate is for a smaller caricature. And 25, he said, and 50 for more detail. That's a good rate, man. Paul said, some days I feel like it's a curse. Most days I'm very grateful. Yeah, I've definitely had those days. I remember uh, there was a period of time where I was unemployed when Ben was first born. And I, I guess I wasn't unemployed. Like I was adjuncting, I was teaching art classes and stuff. But here I was with like a master's degree and like I couldn't get a job for like a month and a half. And I went on like, uh, I, and I know everybody's had these moments, but it's like I went on these job interviews where I remember like every other interview, it was like either I was overqualified or underqualified. And, uh, it's just frustrating because I was like, well, I just need a job, you know? And I think at the time it was because I was looking for like anything. Um, 
but that was a rough period. And I remember, especially during that time being like, feeling like very depressed and very trapped where I was like, I should have just gone into like law or medical stuff or something like more wrote, like, you know? Um, so it's, I've definitely had both sides of the coin where most of the time I feel like I'm very fortunate for doing what I do, but there's definitely uh, times where, you know, and, and you definitely reach these ages like, yeah, exactly. Like at, at the time, especially cause I was freelance, like the health insurance thing was rough. Like it was just, it was just hard. Um, but it's like, um, but in general, it was like, uh, it, it's been a blessing to do. It's just like, I think any choice you make, like you definitely have these times as an adult where you're so far into a career where it's like, you really don't have a ton of options to pick other stuff. And I think creatives definitely, especially cartoonists, uh, because what we do is so like thankless and <laughs> I don't want to get depressing or anything, but it's like, it, 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 there are definitely times you know, I've definitely had times where I spend it, you know, five years on a graphic novel and it comes out and like two people care <laughs> where I'm like, why did I why am I doing this? Like, why did I spend, you know, five years of my life on this thing that like four people read and like I can't even get, you know, close friends to be interested in or something. I've definitely had those dark times. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think overall I'm pretty happy with my career choice. And I, and again, it's like, like Paul was saying, I don't think half the time it really is a choice. It's just sort of where, um, that's another time where also like my faith helps and stuff as, as corny as that is, because it's like, this is kind of where God like has put me in and, and designed me to have these interests. Um, and so I kind of need to just enjoy them. Um, but also, it's a hard career and it's like, there are other careers that are um, simpler, you know, and I kind of enjoy the fact that I have a, a career that's very difficult to do. Um, and not everybody could do. And then uh, Frank said, thank you, Josh. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, and then Frank did uh, a spin on a classic. Frank's rocking some meatloaf. He's, uh, I, I'll tell you what, um, I'm, I, I was going to sing it. I was going to sing Frank's meatloaf. And then I realized I'm not going to sing on this live stream without incentives. Yeah, I can do anything for streaming but i won't do that unless i get a super chat if i get a super chat i will uh i will read frank's i will do anything for work i will do anything for work but i won't do that and i will sing it like meatloaf um until then so what do we have here Frank said, I care about your five-year graphic novel, Josh. Uh, it helped me every time I read it. Awesome. That's cool. Thank you, Frank. It's much appreciated, buddy. All right, so what do we have here? We have... I do like, Frank, that you will drop meatloaf. Um... I think that's pretty awesome. And also, honestly, now I want a street dog. Like, just you talking about a Los Angeles street dog brings up, like, the weird... This is the weird thing about L.A. Everyone who lives in L.A. hates L.A. and talks crap about L.A., but if somebody else talks crap about L.A., I, I'm sure it's like this for most people, but it's like if somebody from outside of Los Angeles starts, like, crap-talking L.A., Oh my gosh. Ha! I love it. Um, Dee Dee said, I will super chat for you not to sing that song. Just buy a cup of coffee. LOL. All right. I appreciate that, Dee Dee. I, you know what? I feel like I owe Frank, though, so I will have to sing that song. Um, 
Let me see. Because I did promise. So, I will do anything for work. I will do anything for work. But I won't do that. How did? How was that? Was that adequate? I love that song, by the way. And I, I still, to this day, I know it's like a long debate by many people. But it's like, what was that? Like, don't you guys wonder what was that? Like, what was the that that Meatloaf wouldn't do? And you got to think Meatloaf at this time in his career, he's a wild man. He's pretty much down to do anything for love. What what was that? You got to wonder. Ah, <sighs> but it's a great song. That's all I'm saying. Uh Frank said I loved it, Josh. Paul said, "Oh my god, that was uh so beautiful." Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I I am I am trying here. Oh, that's right. Frank said he wouldn't leave her. You know what's funny, Frank? I think I've had this discussion and I thought it was all profound, like trying to figure out what that was. And I think you're right. I think that the song makes it really clear that it's just that's the one thing he wouldn't do for love is is leave her. What a sweet man. What a sweet, wonderful person. All right. So we are drawing some uh, some picture frames here. And we are uh, singing some meatloaf songs. And what else? And creating some Victorian rooms, you know? It's, it's all quite lovely. Frank, I feel like if I ever go to Texas, you and I need to hit like a a karaoke bar, you know? You just strike me as somebody like you like part of your world, you know? Um, you like the Little Mermaid, and uh, I I could rock the entire soundtrack of the Little Mermaid. Um, your taste in like cheesy karaoke music um matches that of mine and so i feel like frank i feel like there is some universe where you and i are going to meet up and hit a karaoke bar and just blow the roof off that place and i think paul is going to join us i think this has to happen dd i don't know what your karaoke skills are like but we gotta we gotta consider this you guys Because I do feel like a good, just ridiculous karaoke night is in order, especially, especially, Frank. If you and I meet up, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to have some karaoke. And I feel bad because I know I mispronounce that, and uh, I know every time I say karaoke, I probably sound like nails on a chalkboard to my wife. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. What do we got? Oh, I love it. See, I called it. Paul Pate said, I am a karaoke junkie. My singing is horrible, though. That is my favorite kind of karaoke, Paul. Mine, too. I, I, I have terrible karaoke singing, and for some reason that gives me even more incentive an impetus to like rock it when I do karaoke. Cause I'm like, this is going to sound terrible. And I'm going to lean into it. Didi said, I can't sing at all. That's perfect. Didi. That's perfect. You don't want to sing well and do karaoke. You want to sing horribly. That is the preferable way to approach karaoke. Ha! <laughs> Fr 
Frank said, I think I'll listen to that song tomorrow. As they say, meatloaf is always better on the second day. I absolutely love it. What do we got here? People love it when somebody can't sing, but they just go all in. Yeah, that's the trick. That's the thing, I think. With with karaoke, you just have to, like, you have to, like, come in with the swagger of somebody who can sing really well and just bomb, but, like, lean into it so much that you win the audience over. Because they're like, you know what? They really liked that song. I'll usually pick songs like Paradise City or something like really just like Paradise City. I think why that's such a good song to karaoke is there's no way in hell I'm going to sound good singing Paradise City. And I think that's why I like to karaoke Paradise City is like something like that, that I'm just going to sound awful, but I can just conjure up the gods of rock bernie is ideal um my just mentioned that and i'm glad she did journey is is excellent karaoke material patty klein is good dive bar uh karaoke material for sure Christmas songs may not work so well for karaoke at a bar, but I don't know. My, we'll have to find out. I could see that. I guess around Christmas time, I could see that. My wife loves Christmas songs. My wife. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see here. Okay, I am starting to fade a little bit. I think I'm going to need to put on another trailer. Because I want to finish this page before I eat. And it's going to be a bit. going to take some time. Not as much time as I had feared. Like, I think this will get done. Oh, my gosh. Frank dropped another one. Where he said, take me back to the comic book city where the goggles are green and the girls are pretty. And again, can't sing that unless I get a super chat. That's my that's my new my new super chat bait is going to be like when I get a super chat, I'll sing. If I don't, that's that's fine. Um, which is sad because I actually really do want to sing that. Um, Paul Pate said, I used to work in a karaoke bar. Crazy by Patsy Cline was the most sung song ever. It is so slow and so boring. I hated it. That is Paul saying that. I love that song. I think Patsy Cline was a incredibly cool and fascinating person. However, I will say if you're trying to pick up a bar, like you're trying to get people to rock out, um, that's, that's the thing. Like journey is kind of like, you want things like journey, that kind of stuff. If you really like, you want to pick up a, like to me, the, the best karaoke nights are where you want to like really just, rock out you want to get people moving and happy and and just rocking and rolling and i think oh my gosh all right so we're gonna i'm gonna put the um let's see here i'm gonna put I'm going to put the, uh, my brain is,
blanked out. Okay, so I'm gonna put the trailer for Jacob's apartment. I'm gonna get a refill of coffee. Oh my gosh, uh, I think Frank, I think that's a super chat. I that's the problem. I can't tell if that's a super chat or if it was just turned blue, but it looks like a super chat for a dollar. Um, so I'll take it, even if it's a fake super chat. I have no idea. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and sing that song and then I'll and then I'll put on the, the trailer for Jacob's apartment. Hold on a second. And then um we're definitely going to get into some radness. So, okay, let's see. Let's find it. Uh, Take me back to the comic book city where the goggles are green and the girls are pretty. Please take me down. Yeah, so that's my uh, my try there. I gave it a, an attempt. Um, I love it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, and then he said, right, you want rockin' fast songs. That's Paul talking about. Yeah, you want to kind of pick up the the mood, because, like, otherwise you're kind of, like, doing that, like, we're at a dive, it's super, super late at night. Um, you know what I mean? So, like, like Patsy Cline's Crazy is a great song, but that's, like, if you're going to sing that, you're just going to have everybody just leaning over their drinks just sad, you know? I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, that's a good one. My my pointed out you could do Dolly's nine to five. That's that's a very good very good uh welcome to the karaoke channel where I'm gonna give advice and tips on people uh doing proper karaoke but that is funny what a funny coincidence paul i just had a sense i'm like i have a feeling paul would be a guy who'd rock out doing karaoke and it turns out not only would you rock out you used to work at a karaoke bar that's that's just a that is a that's what i'd call fate uh uniting us so that one day maybe it's kind of like Bill and Ted's where they have a band that can kind of save the universe. Maybe this is what is going on here. I don't know if you guys have considered this, but maybe we can save the universe with our karaoke skills. I'm just throwing that out there, but I mean, very possible. Okay, I, I owe you guys a a, um, a trailer. And thank you guys uh, for the super chats and uh, for the fun of the karaoke. <laughs> Paul was saying we could have a band called the Drawing Wilburys. I like it. Okay, I'm going to save. I'm going to put on the trailer for Jacob's apartment, and I'm going to get a refill of coffee. So here we go. Uh, here is the trailer for Jacob's apartment, and I'll be shortly back. Speak clearly.
that I can play the jug or the air guitar. It's true. Um, do you guys remember the Bear Country Jamboree at Disneyland? I don't know if you guys were fortunate enough to catch that masterpiece. Um, but it was amazing. It was like animatronic bears that did a whole like themed show where they would the what oh the, yeah there's also the my actually pointed out there's also on the peanuts like the specials there's snoopy has these relatives and one of them plays like the juice harp um and they have like a little jug band whenever they get together so there's precedent for that even in the cartooning world frank you could be cool too like snoopy but anyhow, so the uh, Bear Country Jamboree, that's how I imagine what we would do as cartoonists. Um, we do like a whole show set up like the, the Bear Country Jamboree, which I'm, you know what's funny? Now I want to look that up on YouTube. I bet they have, I bet somebody filmed it and put it on YouTube before it was, uh, retired yeah that was a great show yeah and then Dee, Dee said i can play the drum solo in in the air tonight does that count does that count yeah, of course that counts um yeah you could come in and just be like do 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 good do yeah i think that could work Wait a minute. I just sang without a super... I, I need to keep to my rule here. You guys keep talking about music. You're going to get free singing. That's a good song, karaoke too. Yeah, In the Air Tonight would be a great karaoke song. I agree with that. Welcome to my channel where I make cartoons and talk about karaoke. Frank said we can do rock covers in the style of a country band. I love it. I feel like I don't know how to play this, but I think it would be cool to learn how to play like the um like a wash tub bass. That would be fun. We can make it happen. I feel like if you can do a graphic novel, you should be able to like learn how to do. Oh wow, Dee Dee kicked in nine ninety nine, saying for that uh, drum solo crumble. Thank you. I love it. I I'm a professional musician today, you guys. This is amazing. I absolutely adore it. So I don't know. Uh, while I'm uh, working on these flats, what what songs? What are what do you guys think are like the key songs? I would say just this one's for Frank, but I would say part of your world is is like quintessential. Like any Little Mermaid song, but preferably part of your world is that is like fundamental karaoke 101 has to be sung kind of song um that that would be up there um but i want to know your guys's lists like if if you're at a karaoke bar you got the track listing right in front of you the dj's doing their thing Mine is time, of your life. time of your life is what my wife said I would agree. That's a great one. That is a really good one. But I'm kind of curious what you guys would put up there. Yeah. Um, Frank is dead on. He said part of your world is number one. I agree. I think there's just something about that song that's like perfect. Oh, 
Uh, oh, okay. Paul said he, these are the top songs, and I feel like. Oh, uh, Paul said in the air tonight was in the movie Boogie Nights. I had forgotten about that. Alfred Molina did this epic air drum solo. That's true. And then uh, he also uh, he's making. A, oh, my gosh. These are this is a great list coming from somebody who used to uh, be an employee at a karaoke bar. So he's he's speaking from authority, you guys. Um, and I think his authority is showing because he's picking some really good picks here. Um, said Sweet Caroline, Margaritaville. Very good picks. Stand by me. Stand by me, Maya was saying. That's a good one. I would say like meatloaf is great. Meatloaf is up there. Philip Chandler's joining us. Philip, how's it going? We're working on comics and talking about uh, our top karaoke picks. So uh, you've got to let us know. Philip, if you're in downtown Toronto or something and like, you, you know, you've gone out for a couple of drinks with friends and, uh, and now it's time to like pick from the karaoke list. Um, what songs do you pick to just like belt out? Uh, that's that's what we're talking about right now. While we're working on Victorian historical comics, because why? Because this is uh this is my stream, and uh, that's what we do. <laughs> we work on comics and talk about karaoke. Apparently. <laughs> I kind of love this about the live stream, though. I don't know. USSR. Oh, yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, the Beatles, USSR. That's that's like, um, I would say, if I have to karaoke a Beatles song, I would want to do Why Don't We Do It in the Road. That is just a raw, awesome song. And uh, again, like, I'm, I'm bound to blow it and just not sing it correctly. Um, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> Happiness is a warm gun could be a really good uh, song. Beatles song. This is getting fun. Starry eyed surprise. Don't know about karaoke, but the lyric and tune is so catchy. And you've probably never heard of it. Uh, Paul Pate said... OMG, one night on Halloween, I dressed up as a cow. I got real drunk and did karaoke. Ha! I sang the song, Let's Get Drunk and Moo. <laughs> Dee Dee said, uh, Evening, Philip. And Philip said, Ah, karaoke, I'm terrible at it. LOL. So am I. That's why I do it every once in a while, because it's fun. Um... Oh, man, Frank is trying to get me to sing again, and I've already established a rule. I will only sing for Super Chats. Um, but uh, Philip said, uh, although I have done Rainbow Connection in the Kermit the Frog voice, in the Kermit the Frog voice, that's amazing. Yeah, I, you guys, I wish we all lived closer. I'd literally be like, okay, forget working on comics. We're doing karaoke, you guys. This is the plight of a cartoonist, you guys. Instead of doing karaoke right now, what am I doing? Drawing a Victorian building. I'll, I'll have to tell people that, too. Like, if somebody interviews me about comics, I'll just be like, I sacrificed a lot of karaoke for these. <laughs> But I do like Frank's uh, twist on Part of Your World, although I will not sing it. I have my singing rules. Um, 
He said, look at these indies. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collections compete? Wouldn't you think I'm a guy, a guy who has everything? I've got two stories and samurai tie aplenty. I love it. And he gave a shout out. I love it. He gave a shout out to Paul. I love it. Philip said, that would be fun next time you're in Toronto, Josh. Well, I might be. I don't know. I, I We'll see um, if I can like afford to make it work. Uh, I might come back because TCAF was definitely cool. Um, the one thing I'll make sure I do is like fix my card reader. <laughs> but other than that, like I, I, I had a really great time and I love that city. And I think that convention was amazing. I would recommend it to anyone. Um, Let's see here. Now I want to know everybody's best karaoke memories. <laughs> Frank's going on with the part of your world lyrics. I love it. I love it. It's all indie comics themed. I'm going to have to read more of them in a second. Yeah, Paul uh, giving credit to Philip for his rainbow connection as Kermit the Frog. He said, Philip, we are not worthy. I agree. That is, again, like that, that shows to me that you are a man of taste. You are a gentleman and a scholar. I am really excited about getting this further done. Said I just got back from a trip to Montreal, um, blah, 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 to Montreal, Montreal, and Ottawa. Montreal is a really fun city too. Yeah, I really do need to like, at some point, you know, check out more of Canada because it's a, um, it was definitely a cool experience. And like, you know, I it's it's kind of cliche about Canada, but I will say like people were polite like um just at, like in general like people were just kind of overall much nicer you know um made me a little envious of folks who live there all right so we're almost done with these portraits that's kind of cool. I'll take that. Finishing these portraits. Whew. And, I, and I'm trying to keep the colors consistent with the previous page, although the exterior is going to be a little bit darker, so I might have to kind of color match and then modify a little bit on those. And then Paul was saying he used to go up to Montreal, I think, for work, which is kind of cool. So I believe more of that is being discussed.
it's pretty cool though. We're we're getting through it. We're getting through these pages. PD said, I need to head out, streaming in the morning. Watch the YouTube video of Starry-Eyed Surprise by Paul Oakenfeld for a smile. I will. And then, uh... Ha! <laughs> Frank continues. You guys need to watch, like, in the replay, um, some of Frank's, like, amazing um, rewrites of Part of Your World. It's kind of amazing. It's like an indie comic extreme version which I'm really enjoying. Um, Didi, have a good day. Have a good night. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, always a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. And I will definitely watch that YouTube video. And I appreciate the uh, the support and the super chats. It's really cool. Thank you. Um, let's see here. We have got almost the first three panels are almost done. Now, here's the catch. If I cannot color these in time to read to my kid, because at eight, I read to my son every night. So I might have to disappear for a little bit um, around eight o'clock, which right now it is 730. So hopefully I can just knock this out before. But if I do have to leave, um, that will be that will be the cause, which I think is a worthy cause. But I'm still feeling pretty good. Like this is a somewhat complicated page. It's not quite as hard as the um, you know twenty four panel pages or whatever. Um, Sorry, not 24. I don't know if I've done a 24 page panel. The 16, 4, 8, 12, 6, yeah, 16 panel pages. Landon Thierry, how's it going, Landon? How are you doing? He said, What's up, Josh? Not much. We were talking for a long time about the best songs to karaoke. Um, I've established a rule here that I will only sing songs if, if uh, they're super chatted. And then if they're super chatted, I will sing them, um, which led to a couple songs being sung. And then uh, we've basically been chatting about, I think at this point we're talking about Canada. And I'm uh, working on, um, obviously, uh, flat coloring uh, this stuff as well. Paul said, I really dig the pictures on the staircase. Thanks. Yeah, it's sort of setting the atmosphere of this um, this house. This is definitely one of those old Victorian houses that has a lot of history to it. And those pictures are going to become really important for the plot uh, later on. Because there's an action that will involve a picture. And then Philip also said, uh, yeah, I like the lighting on the staircase. Speaking of a worthy cause, you can get my digital 16-page coloring book to print out for a measly $4. That is from Frank. So that's cool. We have... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fun scene, you know? Like, I really enjoyed kind of working this out working out the kind of structure of this and i definitely wanted some kind of mood setting for the lighting too all right Okay, we have finished three of the panels. And now we just have to do this outdoor sequence. 
which is not too bad. So I'm going to play uh, the trailer for Jacob's Apartment real quick. Um, and then I will get back to it. Um, and we'll see if we can finish this. Uh, let's, let's see if that can happen. That would be cool. Um, I might pull some of the colors from the previous one that showed the front too. Frank said, your pages have been looking great, Josh. And thank you, Frank. And then Paul said, he's got to run. It's been delightful as always. All right, Paul, it's good. Uh, good talking to you. It, it was kind of fun to learn a new thing today i had no idea you had worked at a karaoke bar the things we find out on this stream i think are a lot of fun all right guys here is uh frank said i'll do some weights as you talk <laughs> i love it um all right so i'm gonna put on the uh the trailer for jacob's apartment which if you're in the southern california area um this upcoming saturday at two um, from, or sorry, from one to 5 PM at Barnes and Noble in Palmdale, I'll be doing a signing. Um, so you can come get your book signed and, uh, I'll draw on it and all that fun stuff. Um, and then I think after the fact, uh, I'm going to try to go with whoever kind of feels up to it, to bravery brewing, um, in Lancaster, which is a really good microbrewery, um, and to kind of celebrate the release of Jacob's apartment. And that being said, here is the trailer for Jacob's apartment. And then when I when I, I get back, we're gonna plug away and see how much of this page we can get done before eight. So here we go. Speak clearly and see. Paul said, oh, Josh, I watched your vlog you did in the car. It was about death. I couldn't help but think. I hope he doesn't crash. I enjoyed the topic, though. Yeah, there was no intent to crash there. I definitely keep my eyes on the road. Um, where my video is uh, positioned is, like, really close to the um, to the the front window of the car. So it's, it's, it's not that hard to, like, vlog and drive and, and pay attention as I'm driving. But yeah, um, it is a good topic. I'm really excited about that topic, actually. Um, as, as heavy as it can be, I do think like a lot of artists are really, um, I think a lot of us um, are very motivated by uh, mortality and like the limited window of time that we have to kind of work within. And so I think that like that's a rife topic um, and it's funny, right after recording it, Gary kind of emailed me and was like, hey, we should talk about that on his stream on, uh, I think it was going to be this Saturday. And initially I was like, oh yeah, let's do it, you know? And then I realized after the fact that I can't because I have, um, I have the signing, but I will say that is a topic that we, I think very much intend to kind of get into. So hopefully like Gary and I can kind of dig into it. But I mean, the rough idea behind it is like, you know, that mortality is like a, um, a, a massive driving factor, I think for a lot of artists, including myself, um, 
you know, in like creating, because I think when you realize you have like limited time here, your approach to kind of making art is going to be a lot more sincere. Like, because again, like if you have these ambitions to at some point, like do a certain book or do a certain thing and you realize that you're running on limited time, um, then you're going to approach those things with a little bit more urgency. Um, and then also you're going to approach characters and your writing, I think, um, more seriously as well, right? Because you're going to like write characters that are aware of this thing that's like a pending thing. I don't know why my pug has lost his mind. He, uh, As he's gotten older, he just has these moments of like senility where he will just randomly get in a barking fit. And right now he's definitely having one of those. So if you hear that in the background, just picture a pug with their eyes pointing in two different directions, as pug eyes do, um, just sort of blindly barking into the ether. But yeah, Paul, I definitely, um, that's a topic I think about a lot. I write about a lot. And I think uh, I think it'll be a good one, you know, when... I, it's like weird. It's like I almost don't want to get too far into it because I think Gary and I will have a really good conversation about it. I think we've had a similar biography in the sense of like um, points in, a, in our young adulthood that kind of made us like sort of approach and think about mortality at, at an age that a lot of people, I don't know if they were considering it. And like that had a big impact, I think, on our art. So I think it's going to be a good topic, but. That being said, um, thank you, Paul, for like tuning in. I hope you have a good night. Um, I am starting to realize I'm doing these windows here. And I'm realizing this may not happen by the end of the stream because I definitely want to read to my kid. So we have a good 20 minutes. We'll see how far we can get on this uh, bigger kind of panel in the background um and we'll just see how far we can get there's also some windows here and i'm it, it it's it's a little hard to tell what is a window and what is not but i'm pretty sure like that's a window i think that's a window and i think that is a window up there. And then I think similarly, like over here, we got some windows. We got some windows. So Frank, what are you working on right now? Out of curiosity, I'm kind of curious uh, what the next, what's the next thing? And have you gotten your books from the printer yet? Those are my two kind of curiosities right now, I guess. Um, do you guys hear that? My, my nutty, my nutty uh, pug in the background? I was asking Frank what he was working on, and he said, my biceps. I like it. There is one thing I'm kind of excited about, but I never have time to watch television. But I did notice that uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is on uh, Disney Plus right now. So I'm kind of excited about that, because I do like the Doctor Strange series a lot. Um. Do you hear this this pug? He's he's lost his mind. He's an old crazy pug who again like he'll get the, he'll have his like wires crossed and you'll look over at him and he's just barking into the um into the wild like it's something some wire got crossed and he thinks there's something that he hears and none of the other dogs hear it. He's just 
I mean, God bless him. He's a cute little pug, but. Frank said there's been delays on his book, um, but he's hoping to hear more this week. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Especially with the, uh, you know, printing delays and stuff are kind of part and parcel. That's just sort of the life of offset printing in particular right now. That's got to be like immensely hard for publishers right now too. Um, I mean, everybody in the world right now is dealing with just crazy supply chain issues, you know, but like when you think about just printers having to kind of deal with that. So right now we're just going through and we're isolating every single one of these windows. He said, I've been doing some fan art. A sketch out the comic about the muscle guy who gets scared by a bug. <laughs> I already made a thumb, but I can't find the file, so I'm going to redraw it. I love it. All right, guys, we're getting close. At minimum, it would be fun to finish these windows. And then maybe we'll call it and work on the rest of this on a later stream. I will probably come back on and stream in a little bit. Um, so if you guys are up or around, uh, let me know and make sure you're subscribed and you've hit that bell uh, so that you'll get a notification when I'm about to go live. Um, because, you know, like tonight, um, you know, I'm probably going to read to my kid and then like it'll probably be like 830 or nine when I hop on here again and uh, and do another stream and like finish up this page. So. If you want to know when I'm about to go live, um, you know, it could be tonight. I could decide to like do a really quick live stream tomorrow. Who knows? Uh, make sure you're subscribed and you've hit that bell. Um, that way you'll get like a little heads up when we're about to go live. And, um, and there's no like guessing or having to like randomly go to YouTube and be like, oh, Josh is on. Like you can get notified and um, take away that stress of trying to catch it live. Um, I appreciate every single one of you who's shown up, um, and, uh, talked karaoke and had a lot of fun on this stream. It's been awesome. It makes my life a million times better when you guys show up. Um, just because honestly, this thing we do comics can be a really lonely business. And, uh, I just love that I can kind of hang out and talk to you guys um, while I'm working on something that I'd either way have to be like staring at a screen and it's a lot more fun to be staring at a screen with, uh, such a fun, amazing community of, of awesome people. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Um, so I'm just going to finish up these windows and then we'll call it a night. If you haven't, make sure you uh, get a copy of Jacob's Apartment. It's my graphic novel that is a doomed romance story. It's kind of like Eternal Sunshine for the Spotless Mind meets Ghost World. And uh, I think that you guys would really enjoy it. If it, It's pretty much age appropriate for anyone 16 or up. Um, and it's out right now from Graphic Mundi. And if you want, you should just go to your local bookstore and just ask that they carry it. Um, that's one way to support it. If you've already bought Jacob's Apartment, you really enjoyed it, I just encourage you guys to go on Amazon and just leave a review of the book. Like Those reviews really help the book sell and move, and that would be another really cool way to kind of show your support for like these crazy books that I do. Um, I'm going to, okay, real quickly fill this with white. 
I was very much hoping that I'd get a little further, but um, oh wait, I shouldn't fill that with white because then I'm then I'll have trouble selecting it later. So I'm going to fill it with magenta, the part that I haven't hit yet. Okay. And then when I next stream, we'll pull this up and we'll go ahead and finish this page. Um, also, make sure you guys uh, have bought Two Stories. That's my graphic novel that talks really openly about my journey dealing with depression, with uh, with suicide, and um, also with uh, caregiving for somebody with panic disorder. And it's a very, like, that one's definitely not 16 or up. I'd say that's like 18 or up. Um, but that deals with just sort of like some really heavy topics in a very confessional, uh, very old school underground comics uh, tradition of like zap and raw and like, uh, black and white, um, like during the black and white boom, very confessional, um, auto bio stuff. So if that's your cup of tea, make sure you picked up two stories, uh, from Amazon. And, uh, uh, Frank said karaoke Sunday. I might have to record myself singing my version of part of your world. You should Frank, you should. And, uh, and maybe we should, uh, I don't, I don't know. We really do need to do something like that. Um, what else did Frank say? I think he said something really silly earlier. Oh, he said, I did an alien in honor of Gary wildcat for CB Smallwood and a female version of berserk not for, uh, Jeff. I also did a mask woman sketch the other day. I've been working daily for almost a month and feeling healthy. Good for you, Frank. Um, I think, oh, and then uh, Landon was, was saying, uh, did you enjoy the convention? I did. TCAF was an incredible. It was uh, unbelievable. Um, Canada is amazing. And like, there's so many, I, I don't know, it was just super inspiring. Um, and I'll, I, I can kind of get into that when I stream later tonight um, and finish up this page. Uh, and then... Um, Frank also said, so not for my 11 year old. No, I don't think either of these books are appropriate for an 11 year old. <laughs> I, yeah, I think 11 would be pushing it. Um, I think like the age range that somebody can read catcher in the rye is like kind of the age range for like my books. So like probably like, I'd say like the youngest, um, for Jacob's apartment, I'd say would be like seventh or eighth grade. I don't think it should go any younger <laughs> than that. Um, and then uh, Philip was saying, LOL, Frank. Yeah, I don't think it's quite appropriate for that. Yeah, especially two stories. Two stories would not be appropriate for an 11-year-old. So, although then again, I don't know. Maybe maybe you've got an 11-year-old who reads like, you know, War and Peace and like some heavy stuff. And then maybe in that case, I don't know. Um, but yeah, in general, I'd say probably not. All right, guys. Um, thank you to everybody who tuned in. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off read to my kid and then i'll come back and do another live stream so if you're around uh i'll see you then and uh if not i appreciate you guys coming in and i'll see you on the next live stream philip said i want to get two stories i'm kicking myself for not getting it at tcaf hey you know where you can pick it up the beguiling in uh toronto or you can order it uh, at a really reduced rate on amazon so i'd really recommend that and then frank also said my kid loves war, war novels, LOL. <laughs> All right, guys. I'll see you guys on the next stream. It'll probably be in about like 30 minutes uh, after I read to my kid. And I will talk to you then. Bye.